was asked to, to share tonight why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I mean, we live in a time when there's an increased interest in Bible prophecy, but people go in different directions. When it comes just to the timing of the, the rapture, which is the church's deliverance from the coming problems, people believe in a pre-trib rapture, a mid-trib rapture, a pre-wrath rapture, what happens deep into the second half of the 70th week, and a post-trib rapture where the judgment comes to an end and the church is taken up and comes back down. It's, the, the last one doesn't even really make sense to me, to be honest. Can you imagine Noah going through the flood on the ark and the ark lands on dry ground and then the Lord yanks him up in the clouds for a couple hours and drops him back down? You'd scratch your head and say, uh, what was the purpose of that? That makes no sense. Um, the pre-trib rapture, I have become convinced, is the absolute truth of God. This isn't something where I weigh it and I say, well, I'm 60-40 pre-trib, I'm 75-25 pre-trib, I'm 150 to nothing pre-trib. Um, I started out as a young man believing in a post-trib rapture. And I started out believing in a post-trib rapture as a young believer, the same reason a lot of people do. No one's taught you anything. You're just reading the New Testament. You come to Matthew 24 and you see the saints going through the tribulation. You say, ah, oh, church is going to be in the tribulation. And I got that from the Bible. I didn't get it from, no man took me by the hand and tried to convince me of a pre-trib rapture. I just believed what the Bible said. But here's, here's the difficulty. If there's a distinction between Israel and the church, and Israel's got a promise gathering in the Bible at the end of the age, and she does all over the Old Testament, and in the Gospels, and in the Epistles, and in the book of Revelation. And if the church has a promise gathering which is not taught in the Old Testament, but it is implied in typology in the Old Testament, and it is taught in the Gospels in, in an implicated way, and it's clearly taught in the epistles, and it's pictured in the book of Revelation. Then you got these two gatherings. What does this mean? This means when you come to a gathering of the saints passage in the Gospels, you have to ask a question. Is this talking about the promised gathering of Israel, or is it the promised gathering of the church? How are we going to tell? Well, let's, if we look at the word elect, hmm, that's not going to fix it because the elect is used of Israel and the elect is used of the church. If you use the word saints, it's not going to fix it because saints is used of the Israel and saints is used of the word church. And by the way, saints just means holy ones. Just live in a holy life. None of us are perfect, but if you're real, you're on the path of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So how are we going to tell? Well, if you go to Matthew chapter 4 and you start combing through the context, what do we see? We see God upholding the Sabbath. Pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. Does that apply to the church age? Well, some of us talk as if Sunday is a kind of a Sabbath. But we know technically Sunday's not the Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath. And it applies to the Jews. God has never leveled a Sabbath law against the church. Some high churches embrace it, treat Sunday like a Sabbath, but the Sabbath is not a Christian institution. We, we remember the Lord's Day, the day the Lord raised from the dead. And it doesn't, it's, there's no yoke of religious bondage attached to this day. If you have to go out and milk your cows on Sunday, you're not breaking the Sabbath, folks. If you have to fix something broken, like a broken sink or a broken toilet on the Sabbath, you're in trouble. If you have to fix it on the Lord's Day on Sunday, it's okay. At any rate, a little bit of a rabbit trail. In the context, Matthew 24, what do we see? God enforcing the Sabbath. This tells us it's not the church and it's not the church age. We also see that the temple is regarded as the holy place. There's temple service. We see that the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple and defile the temple. How in the world can this be talking about the church? Does the church have a temple that the Antichrist can sit in that represents the entire church? Well, maybe St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, but personally I don't own the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope 
as the head of the church, and probably most of you don't either. So we're really kind of at a loggerhead here if you're trying to see the church in Matthew 24. At least in that part of Matthew 24. Because this is Israel. It's the Sabbath and the temple. But you know what else it says? Flee, those that live in Judea or in Jerusalem, flee to the hills. This isn't talking about, hey, if you live in uh, Alberta, flee to the Rocky Mountains. You live in Montana, flee to the Rocky Mountains. It says, if you're living in Judea, flee to the hills. It's directed to a particular people. So once you start operating in this mentality, I'm going to get what the passage means from the context. Then it will make your Bible study much simpler. Now, I'm going to give you nine reasons why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. The first one is in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And in this context, here we read, in fact, I'm just going to pull it up, and I am going to read the whole passage, so I'll pull up my handy-dandy uh, John 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So where is the Lord Jesus right now today? He's the right hand of the Father. He's in, he's in glory. He's in New Jerusalem. He's not down here. And he says, in, up there in my Father's house are many mansions. And I am going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come and I'm going to bring you to myself and receive you to myself that where I am, it's up there, you may be also. So here, John 14, the next time the church physically interacts with the church. Next time the Lord physically interacts with the church, he's taken them to New Jerusalem. He's taken them to heaven. He's not taken them horizontally to some other location here on earth. He's taken them vertically to glory. This is a precious rapture passage. This is one of the clearest pre-trib rapture passages in the Gospels. The pre-trib rapture was not clearly doctrinally taught, was not clearly doctrinally revealed until Paul with the revelation of the mystery. It's, it's developed, for instance, in First and Second Thessalonians. And then it was doctrinally taught from there. But there's places in the gospel where when you look back with 2020 hindsight, the light comes on. You say, ah, that's what it's talking about. Same with the Old Testament. We see Enoch taken up before the judgment came. This is a picture of the rapture. We see Abraham up in the high plains of Mamre with the Lord and two angels fellowshipping and eating meat. A picture of the church up in glory overlooking the judgment down here on earth, which the picture was the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities on the plain. And there were saints up here, and there were saints down there. Abraham is a picture of the pilgrim journey saints, a picture of the church. Lot is a picture of the earthly believers, a picture of those that are going to be in the tribulation. So here, John 14, we're going to be going to glory. This is, in my mind, a very clear pre-tribulation rapture passage. We see a similar thing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, where the Lord is going to come. He's going to receive his church unto himself, and we're going to be with him forever. Now, this is a very different picture. The saints meeting and going is a very different picture than we see in Revelation
Are we on now? Yeah, there we go. I thought I could hit the mute. So, is this a good mic sound coming out of there? Um, how about like this? All right, good deal. All right. So, in Revelation 19, the saints are descending from heaven at Armageddon riding white horses. So, what's going on here is we go to meet the Lord in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians 4, then we're going to go to Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, with him, John chapter 14. And this is the same as Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, where we are going to go be with the Lord. The door is open in heaven, and we go to meet him. And then we're going to come back down in Revelation 19. It's part of the team that's going to rule and reign here on earth. I'm looking forward to this. I am looking forward to this world being what the world was designed to be. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when education is in perfect harmony with God? When government is in perfect harmony with God? When the court systems and the legal systems are in perfect harmony with God? When law enforcement is in perfect harmony with God? And when we don't need any more lawyers, and there's no need for doctors, and there's no need for dentists, and there's no need for attorneys and no need for a lot of other things that we have need of right now. It's going to be an amazing time. I'm looking forward to this. Now, here's another argument for a pre-tribulation rapture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, which I'm, or through 17, I'm, and I'll read it. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who are asleep. For the Lord shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Now I want you to picture in your mind the word coming, which is the Greek word parousia, and the word meet, which is the Greek word apontesis. Now, in the Koine culture, in the Greek culture, in the Roman culture, when you had a new emperor, and, and he was going to come to his capital city, which would be Rome in the Roman Empire, or he was going to come to the capital of one of the nations that he had conquered, his coming for a royal visit was a parousia, they, it was used in a technical sense. But the apontesis was the, the subjects that would go out to meet him. And they might go out a half a day's journey, a day journey, a two day journey. And they would accompany the Lord back with him. So that this is what the rapture is all about. The apontesis and the parousia, they're related. You, can't, you can distinguish them, but you cannot divide them. The same thing the same relationship we see in justification and sanctification. You can distinguish justification and sanctification. You cannot divide them. Nobody gets justification at point A and can live the rest of their life without any sanctification. Because the Lord Jesus is not a cafeteria lunch. You don't get to go through the lunch line and say, well, I'll take the forgiveness of sins, but that repenting and getting holy, I don't want that. Not, no way. That's worse than liver. So you could, you could I don't want that. No, no, Jesus is not a cafeteria lunch. You don't get to divide him. You get all of him or none of him. Now, same thing with the, the meeting of the Lord, the apontesis and the parousia. 
they, they come together. It's one whole thing. You go out to meet the Lord, you accompany him back. His second coming is the parousia. The rapture is the apontesis of the parousia. It's the going out to meet the Lord for his royal entrance. And I'm looking forward to this day. I had a dream one time. Have you ever had a dream where you're falling and you, you shake and you wake up? Well, I've had a few of those. But I had a dream one time where in my dream, I went up real fast. I didn't fall, I went up. Now, what was interesting about this, I'm talking to two people, I'm in a big log home, and I'm addressing them. And all of a sudden, I just bolted up like a rocket, and I tried to cover my head because I didn't want to bang my head in the ceiling. I went right through the roof, and I looked down below me, there's no hole in the roof. It's like, what in the world just happened? And I just keep going up, and I'm seeing the trees start spreading out, and I'm seeing houses and farms spreading out. And I'm looking around, and there's people all over in the clouds dancing, shouting. You'd think you're in a Pentecostal revival meeting. <laughs> and then I woke up. And my first thought was, rats. <laughs> I am looking forward to that glorious meeting in the clouds. Now, if you see the distinction between the the apontesis, the going out to meet, and the parousia, which is the royal coming, then you understand when we talk about two comings, we're talking pragmatically. We're not talking technically. Technically, theologically, there's only one coming. That's the second coming when the Lord comes down, takes his throne, crushes the armies of the world at Armageddon. There's not two distinct comings at the end of the age. We're just talking in a very practical sense not theological when we talk that way. Now, here's a third argument. The difference between the bride and the guests. Now, I, there's passages that we use in the Gospels applied to the church age and applied to our evangelism. For instance, the, the ten virgins. And I think it's legitimate to apply this to the, to the church and that, you know, Maybe around 50% of those that profess to be Christians are not real. But if you look at the context, when the gospel's going out in these wedding passages in the gospels, they're not gathering the bride folks. They're gathering the guests, not the bride. And why is this? Because these passages are assuming a tribulation context just prior to the second coming. It's perfectly legitimate for us to take the principles and apply it to this age, and I think the Lord intended us to do that. But if we're looking closely at the context, a wedding is going to happen someday. I believe that the parts of that wedding are going to be going on in heaven, like the ceremony itself. But the public celebration, according to Revelation 19, the public wedding supper, the public wedding whatever you're going to call it, party, is at the second coming. And here, you've got guests and the bride. The bride is the church. Now, if the guests or the people saved during the tribulation, then you have to have a distinction between the rapture and the second coming, or there's no guests to attend the wedding. Certainly not earthly guests. Here's another one that goes down along the same path. If there's only one gathering, the rapture and the second coming are the same thing. And at that time, all of the sheep get the reward, and all the ungodly are goats, and they're slaughtered and cast into hell. How do you have a millennium? Now you have glorified believers that can reign and there's no believers that you can reign over. There's nobody to repopulate the earth because everyone on earth is either a glorified sheep or a goat in hell. There's, there's nothing else. That's a difficulty. This is why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. This is why Irenaeus, the early church father, believed in a pre-tribulation rapture because at the rapture, the bride of Christ is going to be glorified, go to heaven, spend a few years getting trained for her positions in the kingdom, 
So she's ready to come down and rule and reign with Christ. During the tribulation, you have a whole bunch more people that are saved down here on earth, Jew and Gentile alike, and they are the sheep at the sheep and goats judgment in Matthew 25. And they are going to, the goats are going to be slain in the Lord's presence according to the gospel of Luke and cast into hell. And the sheep are going to inherit the kingdom. And they are going to repopulate the earth. And then so you've got the glorified church reigning over the unglorified believers that inherit the earth and repopulate the earth. So once you see this distinction between the sheep and the goats, you see very clearly there has to be a preacher of rapture and the second coming. The same thing, if, if you see the dis distinction between the guests and the bride, you realize there has to be a distinction. Otherwise, you only have a bride and you don't have guests to attend the wedding. Now, here's another one that I like to bring up. And that's in Revelation 3.10, where we'll read that we're going to be kept from the hour. Revelation 3.10 says, Because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, what's interesting about this, it says keep from. It doesn't say keep through. The Greek, when they used te reo ek, it meant keep from. You keep them out of something. They're, you don't take them out of something. You keep them ever being in that. Now, if the Greeks were going to talk about keeping through, like preserving you through a time of trial or preserving you through a time of war, they used not te reo ek, but te reo dia, keep through. They, they were able to express precision in their concepts just like we do. And so I've, I've been through the Greek. I've looked at many places that say te reo ek in Greek and how it was used in secular Greek. And I looked at many places that use te reo dia or dia te reo for keeping through. And this is not just a distinction that I want the Bible to say. This is literally how Greek expressed things. So you're kept from the hour of trial. Now here's another interesting thing. Have we had an hour of trial that came upon the entire globe since the flood? Nope. Not even World War II covered 25% of the world's people in earth and in, in land surface. But when we come to this time, it's coming upon the entire globe to try the entire world, to try everyone that inhabits the earth. That's never happened before. It is going to happen in the tribulation. Now, if you keep someone from a train wreck, it doesn't mean you pulled them out of the train wreck and he's still at a pulse. It means he never got into the train wreck at all. You persuaded him to not get on the train because you had a bad dream that something bad was going to happen. Now, once we understand Revelation 3.10, which is my favorite pre-tribulation rapture promise, we are going to be kept from the hour. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute. How about John 17, where we got the same phrase, te reoak, keep from, and the Lord is going to the, uh, keep the believers from the devil, but they're still in the world. How does that work? Well, step back and look at the big picture. We're, we're talking, if you're going to be kept from the hour, and that hour covers the whole globe, you can't be on the planet. You have to be outside of the planet. But if he's just keeping you from the devil, then you can be kept from his awful clutches down here on earth. There's no requirement in that concept to remove you from the earth. And the fact of the matter is, let's go back to Revelation 3.10, because you've kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of trial. In other words, because you were faithful in John 17, I'm going to keep you from the tribulation at the end of the age. Because you were in that Rep. John 17 situation, and you were walking with me, and you were fellowshipping with me, and you were serving me, and I kept you from the devil. You were faithful down here in the world where you were being attacked by the devil, and I kept you from him. Because you're faithful there, you will not have to be tried in the hour of trial. But if you were not faithful in the 2,000 years of church history, 
you are not faithful, then you are going to go into the hour of trial. And you know what? When that rapture trumpet blows, there are going to be a lot of people who had their butts in church pews on a fairly regular basis who are not going to go up. It won't be because they should have attended 100% of the time instead of 80% or 50% of the time. It's going to only be for one reason. They were not born again. You know what? You can go to churches with bad doctrine. Your head can be screwed on upside down when it comes to Bible doctrine. And you can still go up in the rapture. The only thing you have to have is you have to be born again. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and it's impossible to be saved apart from Jesus Christ. He's the only way. You can be saved in a Lutheran church, a Baptist church, a Brethren church, a hundred other churches. You can be in the Catholic church and still be born again. I don't think you should be there, but you can be. Every year, people are in Mormon churches and Jehovah Witnesses. We believe they're cults, and they get saved, and it takes them a while to work through the issues before they leave. They're in a church with insanely bad doctrine, and they're still going to go up because they were recently born again. Now, I do believe if a person is truly born again and they're continuing in the word, that word is going to lead them out of bad churches. That's just the way the, the word works. But the only prerequisite for going up in the rapture is you have to be born again. You know, when you go to Matthew chapter 7, this is one of the most terrifying chapters in the Bible. In that day, many are going to say, Lord, Lord. We were teaching in your name. We were casting out devils in your name. We were doing mighty works in your name. And the Lord says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So what was the problem here? These people were active in their church attendance. They were beyond church attendance. They were active in going through the motions of Christian work. They probably even talked about being born again. What was the problem? They weren't born again. You know what's really interesting? I don't know if you've ever thought about this. In born-again evangelical circles today, our understanding of the new birth and our understanding of prophecy, our understanding of the Word of God has been shrinking over the decades until we are not much better in evangelical circles than the old-time typical Protestant denominations. You know, when the Protestant denominations first started the Reformation, they were on fire for Jesus. They were on fire for the Word of God. They had a lot of truth going. But as the centuries rolled by, they just kind of watered down until people were just comfortable going to church. And they enjoyed going to church. But most of them were not born again. And this is happening in evangelical circles today, too. The one thing that we need, that our children need, that our friends need, that our town needs, that our province needs, that our state, that our nation needs, we need the new birth. Apart from the new birth, folks, all of our going to church is nothing. All of our reading Christian books is nothing. All of our singing hymns is nothing. We have to be born again. And when I think about the rapture, this is one of the most terrifying thoughts for me. We come to a parable that we, we profess to believe it. Do we actually apply it in our practical life with the ten virgins? In this picture, out of ten professing believers, five were real and five were not. Matthew ch chapter 7, many shall say to me in that day. So what's this talking about? Well, there, we know that none of us are perfect. We know it. We feel our weakness every day. God's never demanded perfection. The only thing he's demanded is reality. Are we truly born again? Have we been put on a path where we're being conformed to the image of Jesus, where we hunger for his word, where his word works in our heart, where his word renews our mind, where his word gives us new ways to look at the world so we're looking at it with more light so we have a greater vision for him and for his things for we have a greater vision for his glory for his coming glories or are we just doing the church thing 
just showing up once in a while. Dropping our backside in a pew. You know, God help us here. We need to get this gospel message out. We need to get it out. Every one of us knows people that professes to be Christians, and we wonder, boy, you know, sometimes this wonder, do they really know? Sometimes we can't tell, can we? We just can't. Our discernment's imperfect. But if we understand that there is a problem going on, then we just keep feeding the word. We just keep giving the word. We just keep giving the gospel. And some of these people, they're going to come to their senses and they're going to get right with God. And some of them will have just been backsliding. And some of them will have just been lukewarm. And some of them will have gotten saved for the first time. But thankfully, no matter what we're dealing with, the answer is always the same. Isn't it? Repentance and faith. That's the simple answer. Anyway, I went off on a rabbit trail here in the gospel. We are talking about arguments for a pre-tribulation rapture. And we just went through Revelation 3.10. Now, argument number six. I want to point out that when you look at the seals, the first six seals, the first judgments being brought upon the world, we see two classes of people. Those that are going to watch the seals be opened from heaven and those that are going to experience the seals down here on earth. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, we have a picture of the rapture where the Lord says to John, there's a, a door opens up in heaven and a window opens up in heaven. And the Lord says, come up here. This is a picture of the rapture. How do we know it's a picture of the rapture? Because in chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Revelation, we see the 24 elders in glory. And they're the representatives of the church. How do we know they're the representatives of the church? Because if you read carefully through those two chapters, you're going to see a few things. One, you're going to see they're bought by the blood of Christ. That tells us they cannot be angels, they have to be human beings. Only human beings are bought by the blood of Christ. Another thing we're going to see... They're sitting on thrones. Now, some versions talk about chairs. It's thrones, folks, not chairs. Just look it up. They also have their Stephanos crowns, or reward crowns. So these people are already rewarded. When do we get a reward? At the rapture and resurrection. So these people have already gone up in the rapture and been rewarded, and then they get to be there in the throne room of God when the scroll is brought to the sun to open. And he's going to peel that first seal, and the Antichrist is going to come out down here on earth. So notice, the church is in heaven, rewarded and glorified before that first seal is opened. We are not going to see the first seal. There's going to be a ton of people down here on earth that are going to see that, and you know, during the tribulation, we see in Revelation 7, there's going to be a great multitude saved that no man can number. It's going to be a great work of God down here. I suspect that in the first few weeks after the rapture of the church, you're going to see people all across America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, England, people getting saved left and right. Can you imagine belonging to an evangelical church and all of a sudden, half your friends are gone. And there's reports about tens of millions of people around the globe are banished. And then the, the, the official interpretation of the government comes out, well, we don't know for sure what exactly happened, but the official position coming out of the White House right now is that we suspect that we've been invaded by an alien race from another galaxy. And we suspect that they took human beings from the planet. Now, we don't know why they took them. There's two main theories. One theory is they're going to reprogram and then bring them back. And the other one is they're going to take and use them for slave labor in some mining colony somewhere. But anyway, they're going to be looking at this alien invasion thing. 
But there's going to be people who are going to know better. They'll never buy that. Their family, their friends, their neighbors, their workmates, their kids, their parents were born again and taught them about the rapture and taught them about Bible prophecy, taught them about being born again, and they're going to know. They're going to hang their head in shame. Man, I knew better. How dumb was I? I had to have my pot or my alcohol or my friends or my whatever, or I put it off till tomorrow. I knew better. I could have been up there in glory, and now I'm going into the tribulation. But they're going to get saved. They're going to know the only way of salvation is Jesus Christ. And they're going to know that their family and friends are in glory. And they're going to get saved. I think we're going to see a massive wave of salvation right after the rapture. It's going to be a good time. Well, it lasts because it's going to get ugly down here in a hurry. Now, some other interesting arguments that we have here. The morning star versus the sun rising. And I brought this one out a little bit earlier uh, in one of my other messages. In, in the typology of scripture, just like we have natural days, and that day you first notice it's coming, where you see this twinkling in the morning star, and then you see the gray dawn, a little bit of light on the horizon, on the eastern horizon, and then, and then it gets lighter and lighter, and then is the the day starts to dawn and then the sun rises and then you go through the whole day. Well, in biblical typology, we have the same thing. It's all talking about the day of the Lord. Now, let me put this out. If you're talking, the day of the Lord and the day of Christ are the same thing, but they're looking at it from a different perspective. The day of Christ or the day of Messiah is that day viewed from the perspective of the deliverance of the believers. The day of the Lord is looking at that same day from the perspective of the judgment of the ungodly. Once we bear that in mind, then it's going to help us understand a lot of principles of Scripture. Now, when the, the twinkling of the morning star, that's the picture of the rapture. The rapture is called the morning star in places like Revelation 2.28, Revelation 22.16, and 2 Peter 1.19. That... When that morning star shines and the church disappears from the globe, that's the world's warning shot over the bow of the ship that God is coming. The Lord Jesus is coming. The day of the Lord is coming, and he's going to rattle and shake this world. Th that rapture is like a big slap upside the head and so say, this is your last warning. You need to wake up. Now, the the whole time of tribulation from the rapture going into the 70th week and then right up to the second coming that's the dawning of the day just like it gets brighter and brighter and brighter until it's full bore day and then the sun comes up over the horizon with burning heat that's what the tribulation time is that's what the 70th week is the sunrise according to Matthew chapter or Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 through 3 that's the second coming and that sun is going to rise with blessing for the godly and burning heat for the ungodly. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. It, it's a blessing for the godly and judgment for the ungodly. And then the millennium is that day lasting for a thousand years. It's the Lord's Sabbath rest here on earth when the godly get rest after 6,000 years of sorrow and pain and labor and persecution and tribulation. And man, do I long for that day. When the last shall be first and the first shall be last. You know, right now, the believers are the scum of the earth. Nobody is more despised on this planet than the Bible-believing Christian who takes every word, every passage, every chapter, every book, Old Testament, New Testament, at face value, dead serious. The world will look at you like you are a nutcase that's come unglued if you walk that path. But this is the path of following in the footsteps of the Messiah. This is the path of being a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to have that in our life. Now, when you understand the difference between the morning star and the sunrise, 
then you understand the difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming. They're closely related. You, you can distinguish them. You cannot divide them. But neither can you equate them. They're not the same thing. If you met someone who's trying to convince you that the twinkling of the morning star and the sunrise are the exact same time of day and it's just a, a great big government delusion, it's a collusion, it's a conspiracy to try and get you to think they're different things, you would start wondering if the guy was on drugs or had a mental breakdown, deserves to be on the psychiatric ward in a straitjacket. But the fact of the matter is, this is the kind of mistake that people make, and they make it because they're not paying attention to plain statements of Scripture and plain teachings of Scripture. Let, I'll just use this for an illustration to make a point that I regularly make. We need to be students of the Bible in, in the way that we, we refuse to take one or two verses with the official interpretation of those verses. We call that a gloss. And we refuse to be swayed by that. We'll, we'll, when we hear that, we'll say, well, we'll investigate. That could be true. It might not be true. We want to look at every passage in the Bible on the subject. Genesis to Revelation. And, and weigh every passage because the right perspective on any issue, whether we're talking about the um, relationship between repentance and faith in the gospel, whether we're talking about um, the rapture and the second coming and the tribulation, whether we're talking about um, any, any other subject in the Bible, the, the matter and form of baptism, we want the whole picture of the scriptures on the subject, not just the proof text. And if we do this, if we make this our matter and our manner for studying the Bible, we can't be led astray very far or very long because the Bible is self-correcting and it will correct us. And if we leave ourselves open to the scriptures, it can correct us. Now, argument number eight, and we got two left here, is the distinction between Enoch and Noah. You're familiar with the flood. Noah went through the time of judgment. Where did Enoch go? Enoch went up before the judgment came upon the earth. Now, some people say, well, Enoch can't be of the type of the rapture because Enoch was centuries before the flood. And they'll just mock and scoff. I got an answer for that. If you're going to use that for an argument, I'm going to just tell you right to your face, you have no idea how Bible typology works. Bible typology is not a typology because if you step back and you have an exhaustive history, it, the exhaustive history matches up exactly with the Bible doctrine in the future. Typology works because the Bible put the scriptures together in such a way that in the Bible we see a picture. When we come to uh, Melchizedek being a type of the Lord Jesus, if you go to the real history, Melchizedek was a human being that actually had a mom and a dad. But what do we see in the, in, in the Bible? In the, we see Melchizedek introduced, and typically when people are introduced in the Bible, uh, they're introduced with a genealogy. And he's introduced without a genealogy. It doesn't mention his parents, doesn't mention his dad, doesn't mention his mom. It presents him in a unique way. And it did that for a purpose. To be a picture of Jesus, the eternal high priest, in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of the Jewish priesthood. So when we come, so Melchizedek, the typology is on the pages of scripture. It's the Lord took the pieces of history he wanted, put them in the Bible, and made the typology. The same with Enoch. He took Enoch and he put him in the Bible where he wanted in relationship to the flood because the Bible makes the typology. Anyway, a little lesson on typology. In, the, in this picture, Enoch goes up and then the judgment is going to come down and Noah is going to go through the judgment. We have the same thing in the future. We're going to have saints that are going to go up before the judgment and saints that are going to go through the judgment. 
The last argument we see a, a, the distinction in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 about the, the interplay between the rapture and the day of the Lord. Now, in chapter 5, verse 1, 1 Thessalonians, Paul wrote, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you don't have any need that I write to you because you yourselves know that the day of the Lord comes a thief in the night. The day of the Lord teaching was all over the Old Testament. They didn't need to hear any more day of the Lord teaching because they were already familiar with it. But when we come to chapter 4, in verse 13, and he, when he's going to write on the rapture, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. He's introducing something they weren't familiar with. He's teaching them a new teaching. So he's saying, I'm teaching you on the rapture. You're not familiar with the rapture. You need to understand the rapture. Then he moves on to the day of the Lord. He says, you already understand the day of the Lord. You don't need to understand this. You're, you're familiar with it already. So he's treating the rapture is different than the day of the Lord. And this is a blessing. Once we see this difference, we walk through a bunch of differences here tonight, and hopefully this is going to help you process this subject and see that there is a difference between the rapture and the second coming. Um, a, a couple interesting things I'll point out too, and I already pointed this out, but it deserves reiterating. At the rapture, it's the godly being removed and the ungodly are left. At the second coming, it's the ungodly being removed and the godly being left. So you can tell when you're in a context whether you're looking at a rapture context or whether you're looking at a second coming context. If the context has the godly being removed and the ungodly left, you're looking at a rapture context. If you're in a passage like Matthew 13 that has the ungodly being removed and the godly being left, you're looking at the second coming. You know, I struggled for 10 years as a young believer wrestling with Bible prophecy, reading everything I could get my hands on, but despising the pre-tribulation rapture teaching. I hated it with a passion. And if people try and convince me of a pre-trib rapture, I'd get mad at them, I'd get angry, I'd throw a fit, throw a stink. Um, I just, I hated it. I just rejected it out of hand. It just, there was, I was not going to consider it. It couldn't possibly be right. But yet, as I studied the scriptures it became clear to me that I was in the wrong and that the pre-tribulation rapture was actually the only position that makes sense and makes harmony out of all the prophetic material in the Bible. And once I surrendered to the pre-tribulation rapture, I was not struggling with prophecy anymore. The whole thing exploded with light for me. Now, that doesn't mean I had every detail figured out, but all the big pieces fit together. It's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together and all of a sudden you get this, this inspiration and you grab a few pieces, you put them in, it's, oh man, now I'm on the way. This puzzle's toast. Now I got this figured out. And that's the way it was for me with the pre-tribulation rapture. Once I understood there's a clear distinction between Israel and the church, Israel's got her own program with God. The church has its program with God. The church is the program for the salvation of individuals throughout this whole age. And then Israel is God's program for the salvation of a nation to have an elect nation in the kingdom. Two different programs. Once you see that, and once you see the difference between the morning star and, and the sunrise, once you see the difference between the apontesis of the parousia and the parousia itself, these things start coming clear to you, then prophecy just starts to make a tremendous amount of sense. Well, I'll leave you with that. Uh, may the teaching of the Lord's word be a blessing to you. Hopefully this has been an encouragement to you. I find that one of the greatest blessings that we can give to the church around us today, to give them hope in a world that looks like it's going to, um, it's heading for a train wreck in a hurry, is to understand that God has a plan for his church, for Israel, and for the world. And, and the church has got the glories of the rapture, 
Israel has the glories of being restored as the people of God, and the world has the promise that once they get through this time of tribulation, if they're a believer, they got a glorious kingdom coming. So give people the hope of the prophetic word. First you give them the gospel, and once they get their feet anchored in the gospel, then you give them the hope of the prophetic word. And these are the two biggest messages in the Bible. They are the South Pole and the North Pole of the whole message of redemption in the Bible.